Greetings in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Welcome to the third Sunday of our Mission Celebration Month. My name is Lazelle and I serve in the Missions and Benevolence Ministry. Union Church offers another way to worship online through the UCM mobile app. You'll get to listen to previous sermons, take notes, access the Bible, devotionals, and other resources. Search Union Church of Manila on Google Play or Apple App Store. Calling all parents and guardians. Registration for Kingdom Kids School Year 2021-22 to is ongoing. For toddlers to grade 6, whether currently attending Sunday school or first-timers, the link to the registration form is posted on the website and on the Kingdom Kids and UCM Facebook pages or scan the QR code on your screen. The Youth Ministry invites students in grades 7 to 12 to join the online service and fellowship. For updates, like Disciples of Christ United on Facebook. UCMU begins its next six-week session on October 2. Classes will be about Gospels and Acts of the Apostles. To register, please email the address on your screen. How do you cultivate intimacy with a God who isn't physically present? Join the Kingdom Women Fellowship with a new series, Finding Intimacy with an Invisible God. We will unpack what it means to form a deeper, lasting connection with God through meaningful practices and rhythms of our daily lives. Anyone can join for the first time, anytime. There are many ways to give or donate to the church. Please visit the website or check the bulletin for details. In celebration of Missions Month, we invite you to a time of prayer for Frontier People Groups of the Philippines. Join us on September 23 and 30. Let's watch this video. The Philippines Known to be the only Christian nation in Southeast Asia, Christianity is its largest religion, with 91% of its population claiming to be Christian. But of all its 200 people groups, there remain 30 unreached people groups. And of that 30, 7 remain to be frontier people groups. Frontier people groups are unreached people groups with little Christian presence of less than or equal to 0.1%, and only portions of scripture are written in their language. As we celebrate Missions Month this September, join us as we pray for the following Frontier People Groups of the Philippines on Thursdays. September 9, Iranun. September 16, Maguindanao. September 23, Jama Mapun Bajau Kagayan, September 30, Sama People, Northern and Southern, via Zoom. To register, scan the QR code. See you then! Well, hello Union Church of Manila and hello to everyone tuning in for this time of worship. We're together once again. Of course, another week has passed. It's Missions Emphasis Month uh, at Union Church of Manila. And we go now to God to help ask Him to usher us into this time of worship. God, we thank You for worship. We thank You that You've created us for worship. That You invite us once again today and every day to worship You in spirit and in truth. And we ask once again that You would take our collective heart, take all of us, take our collective heart together, our collective thoughts, and Lord, help them to just be upon you in worship. Center uh, our all of our thoughts, our wills unto you, and help us to hear what it is you may want us to hear, see what it is you may want us to see in this time. Be, be exalted, Lord. We love you. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. He is... The Holy and Almighty One, Merciful and Mighty One, The Only Perfect One, Power, Love, 
purity personified. For he is Trinity, all three, holy, holy, holy. All his creatures, let his song rise. Turning back, no turning. 
Let us bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, we glorify you for you are the great I am, our mighty God. We exalt you for you are our rock, our refuge and redemption. We declare that you are our healer and protector. We thank you for your steadfast love and abiding faithfulness. Father, forgive us for not listening to your voice always, for relying on our own understanding instead of trusting you with all our hearts. Make straight our paths as we acknowledge you in all our ways. Lord, we pray for courage and wisdom to speak boldly, to bear witness and proclaim who you are in whatever situation you lead us into. As Paul wrote, we pray to be your letters, to be known and read by everyone, written not with ink, but with the spirit of our living God, written not on devices, but on the tablets of our hearts. On this Missions Month, we lift up to you those you have called on your great commission to all the nations. We pray that those beautiful feet will always find open doors and fertile grounds so that the harvest will be bountiful. We pray for our ministry partners that you give them the strength and resources to do good work in your name. Lord, watch over these harvest workers and keep them safe. Father, we call on you to bless our church family, our pastors, staff, volunteers, and the congregation. In this difficult season, Father, may we be grateful and find joy and peace in what we have. Give us strength and perseverance in our struggles. Give us hope that even when there is darkness, it is all in accordance with your will. And in the end, all will be brought to the light for your glory. We ask all this in the mighty name of our Lord Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let's mark our celebration of missions by featuring Christian creeds from different cultures around the world. Today we recite the Korean creed. We believe in the one God, maker and ruler of all things, father of all humanity, the source of all goodness and beauty, all truth and love. We believe in Jesus Christ, God manifest in the flesh, our teacher, example and redeemer, the savior of the world. We believe in the Holy Spirit, God present with us for guidance, for comfort and for strength. We believe in the forgiveness of sins, in the life of love and prayer, and in grace equal to every need. We believe in the word of God contained in the Old and New Testaments as the sufficient rule both of faith and of practice. We believe in the church, those who are united in the living Lord for the purpose of worship and service. We believe in the kingdom of God as the divine rule in human society and in the family of God where we are all brothers and sisters. We believe in the final triumph of righteousness and in the life everlasting. Amen. As we celebrate Missions Month, one of our partners will share with us how our love and support as a church community help their ministry. Let's watch this video from Mission to the World Philippines, Ang Bahay Parola.
Good day to all our friends at Union Church of Manila. Steadfast in service, strong in Christ. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Romans 12:11. It will be difficult to share with you today the ministry of taking care of children without touching on the pandemic, sometimes inert and seemingly controlled, raging and ravaging the next, and how the pandemic has both created and highlighted the need of the children to be assuaged from their fears, their weariness, and their anxiety. The task of being entrusted with molding a child during his or her formative years can be quite daunting. When you factor in the reality that these children suffered severe neglect and horrific abuse, warranting separation from their very own parents, the task can be overwhelming. Den Den was rescued from the streets of Metro Manila when he was found begging and rummaging through trash. When Den Den was admitted in Ang Bahay Parola Grace Home for Boys, he would engage in rough play, be easily angered, and would display fits of aggression. Through a discipleship program, Den Den came to know the Lord and surrendered his life to Him. Today, Den Den is a well-adjusted 10-year-old who enjoys playing cymbals in Sunday worship service and leads his discipleship group in prayer. We at Ang Bahay Parola thank the Lord, our Almighty God, that our confidence rests on Him and His Word. For it is said, For the love of Christ controls us, so that they who live might no longer live for themselves, but for Him who died and rose again on their behalf. 2 Corinthians 5, 14-15 the ministry of caring for the children in Ang Bahay Parola is founded on our great God and the immense and immeasurable love that He generously bestowed upon us. And while we will never be able to fully comprehend or bestow this same love upon others, it is this love from God that we always go back to when fatigue and frustration set in. Our love for God compels us to face each new day with eagerness and anticipation, to share with the children who Jesus Christ is and what He has done in our lives. I am Rowena Cordon, Executive Director at Ang Bahay Parola, a Mercy Ministry of Mission to the World Philippines. Oh, no, no.
I am excited today to be able to share with you that uh, a longtime member of the UCM community, uh, ordained minister of the gospel, a longtime missionary, Dan Chalmers, is sharing the message with us today. Uh, he and his wife, uh, Carla, have been serving in the Philippines, uh, very instrumental in starting a variety of different ministries in the Philippines. He came to the Philippines as a child. His, his parents served here for much of their lives, and, and he has been devoted to this country for so many different years. Not only is he devoted to the country of the Philippines, he's devoted to the Great Commission. He's devoted to the call of Jesus Christ into the harvest. And every time I talk with him, he's passionately sharing with me about that. And so Dan has spoken at Union Church of Manila many different times. But I think the most appropriate thing for Dan to share about is the harvest and and the mission that God has called us to. And so I'm delighted that he is sharing with us today. I pray that you would tune in and, and, and listen to the words that he has to give to us and he had to film in Batani. It was during this time where it's hard to get into uh, Manila. And so, uh, but we're still grateful that he is able to share with us. And he's taken the time to record for us. So let's pray and invite the Lord into our time together. Lord, I pray that you would just um, use the words of Dan to challenge us into this call of the harvest. And that you would just help us to have the beautiful feet that... Dan will be sharing about today to take the gospel to different parts of the world. So Lord, challenge us in your word, inspire us and encourage us. And we ask this in your name. Amen. Good morning. Do you see him? Wherever you are in the world today. The text this morning that was given to me by Pastor Chad is Romans 10, 13 through 15. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they call on the one whom they have not believed? How can they believe in the one whom they have not heard? How can they hear without preaching? How can they preach without being sent? How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Pastor Chad, when he assigned this text to me and the context of missions, I was rather excited because this text, it has a lot of symbolic language in it, has an interesting way of approaching missions through kind of the Socratic method, through a bunch of questions. But it begs the question of who needs to call on the name of the Lord. I remember in 1982, Carl and I went to an event uh, for the installation of um, a pastor professor and ourselves to be sent as missionaries overseas. And I remember Carla babysat this young boy back in 1982. That young boy today has 1.2 million TikTok followers, and he's a wealthy entrepreneur. That young boy, the son of a very famous pastor today, at the time he was not that famous, but today he has 1.2 million Twitter followers trying to get everybody to follow Jesus. And his son is basically stating that the Bible is merely a compendium of books taken from a bookstore and put together, and no more than that. It is not the Word of God. And not only that, he goes on to say, and rather interesting, not sure what it all means for the rest of us, but he basically says, Christians don't believe in hell, because if they believed there was a hell, and it was that great, there would be a lot more of them that would go the world over to preach the gospel. They live life as if there is no hell. That son of that famous preacher today and his father have equal number of followers. The son has younger followers and the father has older followers. 
We have a whole population today of sons and daughters we lost who doubted our faith as parents following other gods. I would call them prodigals. So who are the people who need to call on the name of the Lord? These prodigals. They follow the gods of pleasure. They follow science. Are you a little bit confused by science today? One day it's this, one day it's that. we got a little virus running all over the world, giving all of us this incredible fear of COVID. Harvey Cox, professor of divinity at Harvard Divinity School, says that there are modern gods today. One of the modern gods is science. And illustri to illustrate it, he says, you watch an ad on TV, guy puts on a lab coat and says, Tide, or whatever the, whatever the, um, the soap is that's being sold, is better than the alternative. And it's the guy with the lab coat who says, seven out of 10 mothers say Tide is better. Then we all believe the one with the lab coat. He said that's a proof that that lab coat is science, even though the guy that is acting or teaching or doing that is, is a mere mortal, may not even be a scientist, may just be an actor. But we believe him because of that white lab coat. He said we also worship the God of markets. Never before in the history of mankind have we seen Markets feed as many people on the planet as there are today. And then he says, we have a whole cadre of bureaucrats educated at the top universities. And these young men and women who are educated doctors, economists, teachers, social workers, are what keep the world order for us. The book of Psalms, verse four, chapter 14, verse 1 says, Only a fool says in his heart, there is no God. So who is our mission field? Prodigals and fools. And also, the ones Roman 1 talks about, are the ones who God has revealed, Romans 1, 20, who says, the ones who have seen his creation, who have seen the invisible qualities, the eternal power and divine nature. Those are the people who we need to reach out to the unreached the world over. Pastor Chad has clearly articulated that the harvest is plentiful. The workers are few. We must pray to the Lord of the harvest to reach out. How do we do that? It's not really that complicated. Acts chapter 1, which tells of the acts of Jesus passed on, as Pastor Chad has described, tell us in chapter 1, verse 8, you shall be my witnesses. What are witnesses? Martu, martyrs is the Greek word. You shall be my witnesses. Not like salesmen running all over the place trying to manipulate people into believing. No, 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 no. That is man-made conversion. And Matthew chapter 23, verse 15 warns us, you Pharisees, you run all over the world going at great lengths to convert one, but is as lost as the whole bunch of the Pharisees. No. How do we do it? How do we lead others into that kingdom? The prodigals, the, the ones who are fools, and the ones who have not heard yet, the unreached. How do we do that? Well, they're supposed to call on the name of the Lord, but in inverse order, there is a Socratic method must come to believing, must come to hearing, must come to preaching, and must come from someone sent. So what's the inverse order? The inverse order is you've got to be sent. There is a rich word. The word apostello comes from classical Greek. It isn't common in Koine, 
It refers to, it's a legal term. In those days, they didn't have cell phones, they didn't have text, they didn't have um, email, they didn't have a way of getting legal documents back and forth in split-second time like we have today. So they used the word apostello as a legal definition of one who goes to another land on behalf of the king or on behalf of his master. And he knows his master so well that when he goes... He brings and is able to consummate the deal. So first, one has to be sent. But the, the person being sent has to be a preacher of charisma or the one who brings and proclaims the good news. And his message must be the euangelion, another very rich word. The proclamation of good tidings, peace. The good news that the war has been won. So the mental picture of, of Euangelion is comes from, let's say, for example, Athens was at war with Sparta. The Athenians had gone to Sparta to take on the Spartanese. And they have this war. Just think about all the anxiety of the mothers, the brothers, the fathers, uncles and aunts that sent their son to go fight this battle in Sparta. They marched off to war. They got there. When they arrived in Sparta, the war began. Think about this for a moment. I was watching the news from Kabul, and on the news they were showing a father of one who had three Marines come to the house of one of the 13 Marines who was killed, bringing a flag, that their son was lost. Imagine the feelings of that father, knowing full well that those three coming, those Marines coming, all dressed in their garb, were bringing bad news. The Marines don't come and say, your son is alive. The Marines come and say, your son gave up his life for his country. That's bad news. The giver of good news in that battle between Athens and Sparta, if the Athenians had beat Sparta, that runner would run as fast as he can back to Athens and proclaim the euangelion. The battle has been won. But the message must be a message of truth. God has won. And that is the euangelion, the proclamation of good tidings, peace, that God has won. And his rule is in our life. And it begins the moment the mothers and fathers of Athens hear the good news, the euangelion, that indeed they have won the battle. They no longer have to worry about their sons and their sons fighting in that battle anymore. Their nephews, their uncles, whoever is in that fight, the battle is won. Now, why, even if modern man thinks that science is a god, or that markets are a god, or that a bureaucracy of well-educated teachers, social workers, and doctors and economists running the world are gods? Why don't they work? Why can you not rely on those people? They've done great things. Look, we've gone to the moon. You know, we send, air, uh, we send craft to the Mars and, and even beyond taking pictures of that galaxy. Why does science not work as a god? I'll tell you why science doesn't work as a god. Do you know any 150-year-olds? Any 149-year-olds? Any 148-year-olds? And I could go on all the way down. You and I do not know anybody over the age of 100. So if science was so great, why are people still dying? If markets are so great, why are people still dying? Science can get us to the moon, 
But science doesn't know how to create the moon. Let's go even deeper. Markets are wonderful and have fed more people in the history of mankind than ever before. Markets sometimes fail. 1998, the year 2008. The bureaucracy looks like it can do wonderful things with teachers, with social workers, with doctors and economists. But it doesn't solve the ultimate enemy. And no matter how clean Tide makes your clothing, people still are going to die. Paul is telling us in Romans 10, 13 through 15, that God has some good news. And that good news needs to be first sent by a preacher delivering the right message, the message of truth. Jesus has conquered death. God is in control of every detail. God reigns. And God has given us his word as a God to guide us. Spring of 2010, my youngest daughter got married to the man of her dreams. Dan, six foot five, graduate of a great university, was a rocket scientist in, in, in truth. He was a brilliant guy who was an engineer. Perfect wedding, beautiful wedding, just unbelievable. I mean, as a parent, I was extremely proud of my daughter and proud of my son-in-law. And then after visiting us in 2012, the Christmas of 2011 and 2012, he goes back to the U.S. and finds out he has cancer. A young man. The whole world falls apart. They begin their fight of cancer in 2012, and they begin with surgery, and then chemo, then radiation, then all kinds of test of new type of, of uh, cancer fighting techniques. The whole world falls apart. But in between one of the remissions, Erica, my daughter, becomes pregnant. December 27, 2014, Owen was born to my daughter. We go to the hospital to celebrate the birth of this young boy. And he's born with what's called Mobius syndrome, a cleft palate. Speech will be impaired. He won't be able to swallow. He'll have to be too fat. He had club feet. His feet were literally like this. Your eyes are like this. His feet were literally like this, folded inside. Mobius syndrome. Failure of the 6th and 7th cranial nerve. Between 2012 and 2019, we would regularly go back and take as much time. Carlos spent more time than I. But from the time that Owen was born and we watched him almost die on the first day of his birth, two times, to today, we would go visit. And I remember many times I would go with Owen and I would take him for a walk and I would be holding him in this carrier and it was very cold in winter in the eastern part of Washington and the winds would howl and, and I would sit there and I would pray over my son and I would pray over him. Because of his club feet, I would pray over him. Isaiah 52, 7. And it, the prayer was, how beautiful on the mountain are the feet of them who preach the good news. Seven major surgeries, radiation, chemo, and all of the testing at the best hospitals in the world. On March 26, 2019, my son-in-law died one day before their ninth wedding anniversary. Owen's father died that day. And to this day, I remember 
the brothers, his brothers were there. His father was there, Daniel's father, my son and my other son-in-law, Dr. Tim, were there and we're standing there and we watch Dano die, his last breath. Owen's father died that day. And I remember to this day sitting there just having to carry after carrying out to the hearse the body of my son-in-law along with the help of all the others. And then we walked back in and the funeral director took off in the hearse and I went back inside and as he left, Owen, little four-year-old, was sitting there waving goodbye and he said, bye-bye, Daddy. Bye-bye, Daddy. What is the good news on that very dark day of Owen's father's death? Here's the good news that Jesus was preaching. That the resurrection happened and Dano's body is dead, but Dano is with his creator. And Owen, that little child that we would pray over all of us, and would pray over his feet that they would one day be healed. And daily, he had little steel uh, braces and they would tighten it every day until they were able to take it from like this until it was like this over three years. And I remember praying that prayer and praying that one day my grandson would be able to, to stand up and, and say with with incredible confidence that his daddy is with the Lord and he's bringing the good news to as many people as he possibly can. Nothing about death, infirmities, healing of Owen are canceled because the proclamation of death's cancellation and God's eternal reign is intact. Nothing is canceled because it's already, but not yet. I think there's a false gospel that runs around and says, once you receive Jesus into your heart, you no longer have to face these events. You no longer have to face death. No, it's already, but it is not yet consummated. It has been commenced, but not yet consummated. The truth is death is an open enemy, but the proclamation of the good news, the resurrection, death is conquered already. The tomb is empty, suffering is real, but it's still Friday here on earth. It's already begun, but it's not yet consummated until Jesus comes again. We are like sheep without a shepherd. We cannot stay awake to pray for all those who are crying. We're crying out to the Lord to save. But Sunday is yet to come for many. In 2004, we began the work of, of um, a project here in the Philippines, but we needed to go to another country to negotiate much of the construction contracts that were going to be necessary for what we do. And God gave us a financial advisor. This person was incredibly helpful, spoke excellent English. And we witnessed to her on a regular basis what God has done for us, what God is doing in our lives. But her response was, well, that's nice. And yes, the world needs something like that, but I'm not ready for it. So it's okay. We're there to witness, according to Acts chapter 1, verse 8. We're not there to persuade or break her arm or hold a gun to her head till she accepts Jesus. We just prayed often to the Lord of the harvest, who we knew one day would bring something and a change in her life. She and her husband got caught on the wrong side of political change in this country. We kept praying for her. Then all of a sudden we hear that she's been put in jail. 
And skip forward four years after the jail, she gave us a note, said, I'm out of jail. My husband's still in, but I'm out of jail. Can you meet me sometime in this country? And I traveled regularly to this country, so I went to visit with her in a hotel with my wife, Carla, and we just sat there and listened to her tell the whole story of her, her time in jail. And while she was in jail, she said, I observed a couple of things. One is that the people that I met in jail who were Christians were the happiest and able to cope with incredible suffering inside of that jail. But I'm still not persuaded that that's for me. That may be for them, but not necessarily for me. So I said to her, look, there's nothing I can do to persuade you because this is this salvation that we're telling you about that is in our lives is only something that God has to reveal to you. You have to call out to him and ask him and say, are you really who you say you are? Are you really willing to be this personal God in, in, in my life? Two years later, out of the blue, I am sitting there having lunch with Carla, and I received this call from a pastor business friend in this country. And he says to me, guess who I'm sitting with today? And I said, oh, who, 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 who? well, let me tell you. I'm sitting there in the seat. She gets up to go to the bathroom in this train seat. She gets up and goes to the bathroom. And while she's in the bathroom, I notice her computer says something about the Philippines and about Dan Chalmers. What are the odds? You know, in my mind, I'm going, this is a huge country, great landmass with a billion or more people. How on earth? Would these two people be seated next to each other on a train in a city that was very foreign to each of them, but they both were traveling to that city or from that city? And then they began talking about how they knew me and how they had met me and both had come to the Philippines to visit, but never had the two met. And my pastor friend had the honor of leading her to Jesus. Because all of a sudden she was just wide open as she said, you know, Dan told me about this Jesus and that was his entry and he immediately went in and she entered from death to life, eternal. Whenever we talk to her on the phone, she says, you know, I know when my first birthday is and I know when my second birthday is when I met the Lord. But life is still there. Her husband is still in jail. These stories are about the lives of people who Carl and I have witnessed to. And as Pastor Chad was mentioning to you, the command is to go and to be sent and be ready to go after prayer of asking the Lord of the harvest. But when you go, Along the pathway, the people that you're going to meet, wherever you are, whether it be in your home with the people around you, or it be your neighbor, or it be somebody that you see alongside the road and you say, can I help you pull your car out of the ditch? Wherever it is, when you go, you're being sent and you are to bring the good news and to proclaim the good news of the one sending and to preach that which you have experienced in your own life. Can't be done any other way. I mean, God can do the miraculous as he did that day in that, uh, the, the two people's lives that I told you the story of. But it only happens because God is ordaining it. And you can talk about, oh, it's still your blue in the face. But I will tell you, that day, that young lady who was our financial advisor what are the odds of those two people meeting? Oh, I couldn't even begin to tell you. It's in the billions. A story about God's true salvation that traverses the whole truth, about overcoming adversity and to live by faith in the already but not yet world we live in. It's pretty simple. 
I know it sounds complicated with all the words that I put in there, but it's pretty simple. God is sovereign. That's the simplicity. I am not qualified to be God, nor are you. And in light of that qualification, you and I need to walk, if we trust God, by faith. Trusting that God the sovereign is guiding our every action, our every move, every day. Whether it be my daughter getting married in that wonderful marriage event and seeing it go through this death of a, a seven years of her husband to Owen being born in the middle of it to all the things that are part of that story of the already but not yet world we live in. We must trust God. What are the alternatives? Science? Markets? Money? Well, educated people that eventually die too? Yes, well? Story of my friend in China, the financial advisor, our friend in China, the financial advisor, is a story of God's miraculous calling of one who God wants to save through one who is sent, who is as a preacher, the kerygma, has the evangelion, the truth and the good news of God wanting to rule in our lives and the power over death. Therein is the good news. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we're grateful that you sent someone to us. For without you having sent someone to us, we would not know. Whether it be our father, mother, our neighbor, our friend, our someone coming from afar, we're grateful to you sending somebody and giving us the good message that you are in control and that you are the most powerful and that has created the universe. And we worship you. In Jesus' name, amen.
Now let us receive our benediction together today. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift his countenance to you and may he grant you peace. God bless and have a great week.